Today I'm going to show you proof for why the Muslim religion of Islam is satanic and point out some reasons why it's a false religion. Of course, in my 100% undeniable proof of God documentary that I'm working on, I plan to break down all the major religions even further and compare them to the Bible in order to show you how the Bible is the only book you can call holy and that Jesus Christ is in fact the only way to heaven. Real quick, I'd like to give a big shout out and thank you to all of our subscribers and supporters and thank you to everyone who has donated. These documentaries and videos take a lot of time and money to produce, and I definitely couldn't accomplish this without you, so thank you so very much. And if anyone would like to donate to help with current and future projects, the link is down below along with the links to all of our other channels. And I'd like to say a quick prayer for the family of Aisha. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity and bringing us all together. Lord, please bless every viewer. Please bless every Muslim, and Lord Jesus Christ, please bless the surviving relatives of Ayesha and all of Muhammad's wives, and lead them to salvation through Jesus Christ. I plead the blood of Jesus Christ over every listener and ask that you let them be receptive to this message and your word, and lift the veil from their eyes in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, before I begin, please don't expect me to pronounce anything correctly. My tongue ain't as flexible as it used to be. <laughs> share channel prideless chicks i got the kind of comment i've gotten before and as it says in romans 8 verse 28 and we know that all things work together for good to them that love god and to them who are called according to his purpose so this comment actually turned into a blessing for me in many ways not only did it motivate me more to make this video for them and others like them but it also motivated me to take another dive into the quran and the history of islam and really challenge myself I actually ended up learning a lot because of how much this comment motivated me to research. So I thought I'd read this comment to you and dissect it here because, again, it's similar to other questions I've had in the past and it deserves a thorough answer. Oh wow, I hope you've actually read the Quran to be making such bold statements. I also hope any culture you're claiming is satanic you've actually studied. Islam believes Jesus is a prophet who will return. Wait, 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 hold on. If Jesus is just a prophet, then the Queen of England is just my secretary, okay? Let's continue. I've recorded the name Allah spoken on a random video I was making. To me, that's more proof than any other stated religion who claims they know an absolute truth. I'll never understand a people working for a common good who are intent on bashing each other. Doesn't the Bible speak on a house being divided against itself? When I call it other religious beliefs as satanic, offended people come out of the woodwork complaining about respect, religious equality, and they stick up for whichever religion I'm exposing. But these very religions that you're defending are discriminatory against other beliefs, especially Christianity, which I'll prove today. So if you're saying that all religious beliefs need to be respected, but you're also standing up for a particular religion, especially holding that belief as your own, but that religion's so-called holy book discriminates against other beliefs, then that makes you a hypocrite. The funny pattern I should mention, by the way, while all these other religions will bash Christianity, even Jesus himself, they just so happen to accept other satanic religions, rituals, and beliefs. What a pinky dink. Almost like these so-called holy books were written by the devil himself to discreetly indoctrinate people into doing Satan's bidding, more importantly spreading acceptance for all other satanic beliefs, while simultaneously squeezing out Christianity. The Quran belittles God Almighty, and the Quran belittles who Jesus is as a whole. Believing in it is calling Jesus a liar and is blasphemous. If the Quran states that Allah would tell Muhammad not to speak against idols, that's blasphemous. This is painting God as someone who he is not, which goes against the first commandment, have no other gods before me. 
You're creating a vision of God that doesn't exist, and you're worshiping it. God also makes it clear that he absolutely hates pedophiles. In Matthew 18, verse 6, God says, But whoso shall offend one of these little ones who believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged around his neck, and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. So to say that God would not only condone pedophilia, but choose a serial pedophile as a prophet is a gross insult to God and extremely blasphemous. The Quran explicitly states that Allah is okay with pedophilia in Sahil Bukhari 5133. Giving one's young children in marriage is permissible. By virtue of the statement of Allah, and for those who have no monthly courses, they are still immature, and the idah for the girl before puberty is three months in the above verse, narrated Aisha that the Prophet wrote the marriage contract with her when she was six years old, and he consummated his marriage when she was nine years old, and then she remained with him for nine years till his death. I could go through the whole Quran showing how it spits in the face of Jesus Christ and consistently breaks commandments, the most frequent being the first commandment. But I'll tell you this, the Quran is not just some book made up by man. The God that is painted in this book is not just an imaginary being, oh no, it's a real person. But it isn't Jesus, it's the devil. How do I know that? Satan's name is written all over the Quran in the title of Allah, not only through his recorded decisions and actions, like blessing child abuse and child abusers, and accepting satanic practices, but by researching the history of Islam, it makes it even more clear to us that Allah equals Satan in the Islamic context. Even Muhammad himself knew he was being visited by a demon when he first encountered Allah. He became increasingly more possessed with the spirit of heaviness and the spirit of suicide, almost constantly trying to end his life. Which, by the way, isn't the symptom of someone who is just blessed and chosen by God. I wasn't some biblical prophet, but even I was instantly cured from depression and all suicidal thoughts when I came to Christ. We don't see Moses or Joseph possessed jumping off cliffs after they hear from God. And in the case of Judas, we see Jesus first predict that someone will betray him. And the Bible makes it extra clear that Judas became demon-possessed. So why does the Quran forget to mention that Muhammad was possessed? And why would God choose such a possessed pedophile to do his bidding in the first place? For Christians, Jesus Christ is our prime example for how we should treat others and conduct ourselves in general. Jesus didn't have sex, masturbate, attempt suicide, practice magic, or cross-dress. The true God knows his children will imitate his Messiah, or in this case, prophet. Muslims imitate and think of Muhammad throughout their daily life. They even go as far as to step in the bathroom with their left foot first, because that's how Muhammad was seen stepping into the washroom to cleanse his body before prayer. So for this God to choose a pedophile as our prime role model, and to also make it clear in the Quran that child sex and molestation is okay, then that God wants to create a pedophilic world. And that is the God of this world, Satan. God himself lets us know that Muhammad was of the devil in a scripture he actually brought to me this morning. In 1 John 3 verse 8, He that committeth sins is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. <laughs> Did you catch that? God Almighty said, the Lord said, that the devil sinneth from the beginning, and that the Son of God was manifested. Keep those words in mind. The Quran says that in the beginning, he, Allah, is the originator of the heavens and the earth. How can he have a son when he has no mate? There, we have Satan not only lying from the very beginning, but we have him clearly attack the mere idea of Jesus. Quote, How can he have a son when he has no mate? I'll tell you how Satan can't have a son without having a mate. Because he isn't God Almighty. Only God Almighty has the power to make something out of nothing. Only the true God, Jesus Christ, can manifest himself on earth through a virgin birth. You have to put Allah in a box because he isn't God. And he cannot do the things that God Almighty can do. Muhammad would go into frequent trances, and his nurse even said that she believed that it was demon possession. Muhammad first thought he was visited by a demon when he was grabbed so tightly by a spirit that he thought he would die. He later told his wife and her cousin, Rakhla, who is a part of a Christian sect, 
that said, quote, perhaps Muhammad had been visited by a messenger of God, because this is what happened to Moses who received the great law. So according to her, he was to be a prophet. His wife decided to give him a four-part test to determine whether or not Muhammad's encounter was indeed demonic. She asked him if he saw a being in the room, and Muhammad said yes. She said, sit on my left thigh. Do you see the being now? He said yes. She said, sit on my right thigh. Do you see it now? He said yes. And she said, sit on my left. Do you see the being now? And he said yes. And then she takes her clothes off and asks if he could still see the being, and he said no, it's vanished. And so she determines that it can't possibly be a demon because he's too polite to look at a naked lady. <laughs> Do I honestly have to explain how stupid that is and why it's not a legit way to test the spirits whatsoever, or does the stupidity speak for itself? Side note, a woman was the one who made these decisions, and was the reason for Muhammad becoming a prophet and for the Quran to be written, and by their own rules, a woman's opinion is worth half a man's, so technically, Islam isn't even a real religion. Anywho, Islamic commentary on the Quran made by a close friend of Muhammad regarding 22 verse 52 literally says, A Satan named the White One came to the Messenger of Allah in the form of Gabriel. And they are the High Iranic. And if you research this demon, it's also a pagan god that was worshipped as well. We even have a freaking picture of the thing. Doesn't look very angelic to me. The White One mentioned here is also called the Lord of Monday, and one of the seven kings of the jinn demons associated with Monday. And Muhammad just so happened to talk to this demon on a Monday. Just another coincidence, I suppose. This demon also said that man was created from coagulated blood, or a blood clot. But the true God tells us in Genesis 2 verse 7, quote, Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. And in Genesis 3 verse 19, God says, By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. Ecclesiastes 12 verse 7, And the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the Spirit returns to God who gave it. So the Quran stating we are made from blood clots is just calling God a liar once again. But like I said, I could go through the whole book saying that. The Quran further proves that it was written by Satan to give himself all the glory by simply examining the overall plot of the Quran itself. Someone broke it down so well on their own website that I'll just read their article for you here and also link it down for you below. Considering some of the texts found within Islam, I'm wondering why Muslims take such a stance against homosexuality and cross-dressing. Don't get me wrong, I'm not condoning either one, since the Bible takes a stance against both. Deuteronomy 22 verse 5, Leviticus 18 verse 22, and 20 verse 13, but Islamic texts actually encourage both. Sahil Bukhari 2442 do not injure me concerning Aisha, Muhammad's 11-year-old bride. The revelation does not come to me when I am wearing the garment of any woman except Aisha. Yes, he got magical powers from wearing little girl's clothing, which is just more satanic stuff. Sahih Muslim 44.15 Abu Bakr requested permission from the Prophet Muhammad to enter when the Prophet was lying down on Aisha's bed wearing her garment. Sahih Muslim 4472. The wives of the Prophet said Fatima, the daughter of the Prophet, to him and she requested permission to enter while he was laying down on my bed in Aisha's robe. Get ready, this next one's rough. Musnad Ahmad, 16245. Muawa said, I saw the Prophet Muhammad sucking on the tongue and lips of Al Hassan, son of Ali, for no tongue or lips that the Prophet sucked on will be tormented by hellfire. Hold on one second, please. It's not hard to understand why Muhammad was so pansexual. His hero and model was Satan, who many Bible scholars believe to be a homo, just with a lot of power. Indeed, that may explain why Satan hates women, Genesis 3 verse 15, and why the Antichrist will have no desire for women, Daniel 11 verse 37. But where's the proof that Muhammad's hero and inspiration is Satan? I thought you never asked. According to Islamic texts, Allah was going to destroy all of mankind for not sinning, and then replace us with a new creation that would sin, so he could forgive them and let them know he was their god. Sahih so Muslim 66.21 Abiyah Yub Ansari reported that Allah's messenger said, 
If you were not to commit sins, Allah would have swept you out of existence and would have replaced you with another people who would have committed sin and then asked forgiveness from Allah, and he would have granted them pardon. Sahih Muslim 6622 Abu Harairah reported Allah's Messenger having said, By him in whose hands is my life, if you were not to commit sin, Allah would sweep you out of existence and he would replace you with those people who commit sin and seek forgiveness for Allah, and he would have pardoned them. In other words, Muhammad told his followers that Allah wants them to sin so he can show them forgiveness, so much so that if they didn't sin, he was going to wipe them out and replace them with someone that would. You'd almost get the idea that Allah depends on sin, without which he couldn't have a creation and thus couldn't be a complete deity. Not to worry, Allah. Help is on the way. You have a secret friend who's going to help your creation sin. Can you guess what the secret friend's name is, folks? We could go to the Bible for the answer, but let's see if there's an incriminating source within Islam itself that gives us the right answer as well. Quran Surah 2 verse 35 to 36 we said, O Adam, dwell thou and thou wife in the garden, and eat of the bountiful things therein as ye will. But approach not this tree, or ye run into harm and transgression. Then did Satan make them slip from the garden, and get them out of the state of felicity in which they had been. Quran Surah 7 verse 19 to 22. O Adam, dwell thou and thou wife in the garden, and enjoy its good things as ye wish. But approach not this tree, or ye run into harm and transgression. They began Satan to whisper suggestions to them in order to reveal to them their shame that was hidden from them. He said, Your Lord only forbade you this tree, lest ye should become angels or such beings as live forever. And he swore to them both that he was their sincere advisor, so by deceit he brought about their fall. Quran Surah 15 verse 39 Satan said, O my Lord, because you misled me, I shall indeed adorn the path of error for mankind on the earth, and I shall mislead them all. Notice, oh, it's not Satan's fault. God misled him. <laughs> it just doesn't win either way. Hmm, it would appear that according to the Quran, it was Satan who helped Allah's precious creations fulfill the requirement of sinning, so as not to be wiped out by Allah for not sinning. So who can we deduce from Islamic sources to be the real savior and hero not only to man, but to Allah himself? Why, it's none other than the good old Satan, our undercover ally and misunderstood champion. But wait, it gets better. If Allah needs us to sin so he can forgive us, who would his ultimate enemy be? Would it not be someone who not only never sinned, but also made a way to wipe out everyone else's sin? Well, guess what? There's someone who did just that. His name is Jesus. He simply would not obey Allah's command to disobey. Muslims claim to praise God, to honor Jesus, and to despise Satan. But if we look just a little more discerningly at the tenets of their faith, we see that Satan is really their savior because he leads us into sin, and that Jesus is their ultimate enemy because he takes away from sin. Muhammad worshipped with pagans and told them Allah said it's fine for them to worship false gods. Then the demon posing as Gabriel told Muhammad that Muhammad received a message from the devil. Then this demon tells Muhammad that, quote, that he may make what is thrown in by Satan a trial for those whose hearts is a disease and whose hearts are hardened. Al is apparently cool with Satan speaking through the prophets. He doesn't seem to expect them to tell the difference between demons and angels, or God and the devil. The true God tells us that he takes us much more seriously in Deuteronomy 18, verse 20. Quote, But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. The Bible is clear that only one man and one woman should marry or be sexually intimate with each other. But Muhammad marries and fornicates with multiple women, molests little boys, and was constantly covered in semen. And we're not quite sure whose? Ayesha was reported as saying, I used to scrape off the drop of semen from the garment of the Messenger of Allah. Keep in mind she's a little girl. Quote, I often scraped it, semen, from the garment of the Messenger of Allah with my hand. I asked Ayesha about the clothes soiled with semen. She replied, quote, I used to wash it off the clothes of Allah's messenger, and he would go for the prayer while water spots were still visible. The Prophet used to pass by, or have sexual relations with, all of his wives in one night, and at that time he had nine wives. The Prophet used to go round to all his wives with one bath. The true Almighty God says that we can judge righteously, and one of those ways is by looking for something called the fruits of the Spirit. When someone is possessed with the Holy Spirit of God, 
they are a new creature and go through a lifelong process of sanctification, which basically means that you improve and you sin less over time. When we're born again through Jesus Christ, we go through a dramatic change. For instance, before I found Jesus and was born again, I was honestly the most depressed, the most anxious, and the most afraid person I knew. I was attempting suicide daily. Every time anything bad happened, my mind would just jump to suicide. I was having several panic attacks and meltdowns a day. I was on numerous prescription medications for PTSD, anxiety and depression, and much more. I was also transgender and bisexual with bulimia and anorexia. When I found Jesus at the end of 2020, he immediately took away all of my suicidal thoughts and feelings. He took away my self-harm, my transgenderism, my bisexuality, my bulimia, my anorexia, and my depression. I'm not suddenly a perfect person, but people can see a radical improvement in me. They can see my fruits. God tells us in Galatians 5 verse 22 to 23, quote, For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law, and Muhammad shows no fruits of the Spirit. Here are even more disturbing things Muhammad has done in the Quran. Aisha said, We set out with the sole intention of performing Hajj when he searched Sarif, a place six miles from Mecca. I got my menses. All his apostle came to me while I was weeping. He said, What is the matter with you? Have you got your menses? I replied, Yes. He said, This is a thing which Allah has ordained for the daughters of Adam. So do what all the pilgrims do with the exception of the Talaf, circumambulation. Around the Kaaba, Ayesha added, Allah's apostles sacrificed cows on behalf of his wives. While in Menses, I used to comb the hair of Allah's apostle. A person asked me, can a woman in Menses serve me? And can a Junub woman come close to me? I replied, all this is easy for me. All of them can serve me, and there's no harm for any other person to do the same. Ayesha told me that she used to comb the hair of Allah's apostle while she was in her menses, and he was in the mosque. He would bring his head near her in her room, and she would comb his hair while she used to be in her menses. The Prophet used to lean on my lap and recite Quran while I was in menses. While I was laying with the Prophet under a single woolen sheet, I got the menses. I slipped away and put on the clothes for menses. He said, Have you got nifas? Menses. I replied, Yes. And then he called me and made me lie with him under the same sheet. The Prophet and I used to take a bath from a single pot while we were in Junab. During the menses, he used to order me to put on an azar, a dress worn below the waist, and used to fondle me. While in the itikaf, he used to bring his head near me, and I would wash it while I used to be on my periods. On the authority of his father, Ayesha said, Never all his apostle wanted to fondle any of his wives during the menses, he used to order her to put on an azar and start fondling her. Ayesha added, None of you could control his sexual desires as the Prophet could. Whenever Allah's apostle wanted to fondle any of his wives during the menses, he used to ask her to wear an azar. It is related that Abu Hurairah said, I never see Al Hassan without my eyes overflowing with tears. That is because the Prophet went out one day and found me in the mosque. He took my hand and I went along with him. He did not speak to me until we reached the market of Banu Kurnukwa. He walked around it and looked. Then he left and I left with him until we reached the mosque. He sat down and wrapped himself in his garment. Then he said, Where is the little one? Call the little one to me. Hassan came running and jumped into his lap. Then he put his hand in his beard. Then the Prophet opened his mouth and put his mouth in his mouth. Then he said, O oh Allah, I love him. So love him and the one who loves him. There's also that whole Mecca thing, and I won't even go into how incredibly satanic that is, but I'll leave a link in the description along with other great links to informative channels and videos that helped me in making this video. Some of the links below also go into deeper detail on some of the topics I discussed. I'm not trying to attack anyone's culture, it's just my job to expose the devil and his works. Satan has been corrupting society since before society was even really a thing, so it's not a stretch to realize that all cultures have been tainted. Let's take mine for example. I'm primarily French and Cherokee. I love both cultures, but both cultures are still tainted by Satan. Cherokees, like most Native Americans, held several ceremonies a year, were superstitious, and conversed with demons. They believe that above us there are benevolent spirits along with God, or the great spirit Manitou, and that below us are evil spirits that wish to cause chaos essentially. 
The only problem is that they had no real way to determine which spirits were truly good and which were truly bad, and ended up pleasing demons taking the forms of angels of light. We know this because the Cherokee culture saturated with divination, vampirism via the use of great energy released from bones used for healing, heavy use of drums and chanting during worship, and conversing with the spirit world in general on such a regular basis that becomes a part of their culture. Even if they correctly identified who the true God is at one point, and that is in fact who the great spirit is, they're still trying to communicate with other spirits outside of God, which is sinful and dangerous. This allows demons, posing as angels, to deceive well-meaning Cherokees. Cherokees then end up thinking they're receiving direction from God, or one of his helpers, when it's really a demon telling them, yeah, go shake some bones over on an ill person and pray to spirits to help you, instead of asking the great spirit directly. Or sure, it's a great idea to hang this demonic portal above your head at night to keep nightmares away. There's a lot of beauty in the Cherokee culture, but there's also a lot of satanic stuff in there as well, and there's nothing wrong with separating the two. Separating good from evil doesn't mean I disrespect or hate anyone. There are countless testimonies that you can find where people say that the Bible was ridiculous gibberish before they sincerely sought after God and fully opened up themselves to Jesus Christ. And only after that did they finally understand the Bible. And I remember picking up Bibles and I, I, got, I got a regular Bible, I got... Um, uh, about three or four different kinds of Bibles. I didn't even know which one, which one was white. I mean, which. I didn't know anything about King James or any of that. I just picked up different Bibles because I would read them. And I'd read like a, a paragraph. And after I'd read the paragraph, I'd go, what are they talking about? This doesn't make any sense. What is this? And i go and flip through some more pages, read another paragraph. And it, it was like reading another language. I mean, it just it made no sense to me. So I, would, I ended up going to different churches. I went to, you know, Methodist churches, Lutheran, um, you know, Catholic churches, uh, synagogues, even talked to people with, in Buddha and all that kind of stuff. All I knew was I met a supreme being, God, but I, I met somebody, he cured me, and I wanted to know who he was. And everybody was telling me their own different versions. I even got the truth. I mean, I went to, you know, like I say, the baptism and all that. And they were telling me all about Jesus. But for me, it was like, nah, it's, it's something else. It's something else. You know, I, was, I don't know what I was looking for. But whatever it was they were telling me, I was looking for something else. And I did this for about six, eight months. And finally just got frustrated and said, I, okay, I, I don't know. I, there's a God out there, but I don't know who he is. I guess one day I'll find out. And I just kind of dropped it and continued on with my life. A few months after that, uh, my cousin, who I grew up with um, in the States over there, we were bad kids. We did a whole bunch of bad things and stuff. Um, he became a born-again Christian. He went to Vietnam as well, but he went out with the California. And I heard that he was flying in from California, and he wanted to see me. And I'm in, over in New York, the other side of the United States, about 3,000 miles away. So I said, oh, great, I get to see my cousin. I hadn't seen him in years, you know. We hung out together. He was like my brother. So he comes over, and um, as soon as he arrives there, you know, he hugs and all that kind of stuff. And it was a whole big family reunion thing. And uh, his name is Albert. And Albert says, um, he says, I need to speak to you alone. Can we, is there some place we can go? And I says, sure. Uh, <laughs> across the street to where we were was a graveyard. Um, and so we hopped over the fence, you know, we're young kids, we hopped over the fence and sat over uh, by the tombstones over there, we sat on the ground. And, um, you know, I, I said, what is it, Al? And he starts telling me about Jesus Christ. Now here's the really interesting thing about this. This is why I say, I did not come to God, God came to me. I was searching for the Lord. I mean, I didn't know what it was. I knew I met God and I knew that he cured me but I didn't know who he was. And I, all the searching and stuff that I did, the Bible made no sense to me, people talked to me, made no sense to me. But now, here I'm sitting with my cousin, and he's telling me the same thing I heard before, but the difference is, as he was telling me this, I knew, like Paul says, you know that you know that you know. I knew this was the truth, and I accepted every word that he had said. And then he says, you know, do you want to accept the Lord? And I says, yeah, I do. I said, but, you know, it's something that I, I feel that I need to do in private, you know, by myself. This is between me and God. 
And Albert says, well, I understand that, not a problem. And uh, we went to, went to bed, went to sleep, and um, I accepted the Lord that night. And the next morning I got up and I told Albert, and he was all happy. And, you know, he told me, he says, uh, he says oh, he says, you know, the one thing you need to do is, is to get a Bible and read the Word every day because that's your spiritual food. Otherwise, you'll just wither away. You need to, now that you've been born again, you need to grow. You need to feed yourself. And this is how you feed yourself. Um, is through the Word of God. It's not food. It's, you know, the Word of God is your food. And I was like all excited. I said, oh, yeah, great, 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 great. And, they, and he had a Bible, and, and he gave it to me, and he says, you know, here, you can use mine until you get your own. And I picked up the Bible, and I started reading it, and I got through about half the page. Praise God. I got through half the page. And all of a sudden, it hit me. It dawned on me. I understood it. I understood what God was saying. I mean, here, before that, this is only months before, before that I couldn't understand a paragraph. And now, I understood through the Holy Spirit, I understood everything that he was saying. And it was, it was I never, I didn't go to school for it. I didn't do any of that. It's just, the Holy Spirit, when I accepted the Lord, the Holy Spirit came into me and gave me my first miracle that I could read the Word of God and understand it. I'm sorry I'm blubbering like an idiot, but... And I'm honestly one of those people. I really was. I had read it for years as an atheist and it didn't make any sense until I had the Holy Spirit and then it made a ton of sense. Why is this? Because the Bible is the only book in existence that is fully written by God himself. Notice I say is instead of was. Because the Bible is also the only book in existence that is alive. The Bible isn't just the most accurate and detailed history book, but it's also literally God's love letter to you. I'll demonstrate by reading a little something I saw someone post online. A simplified yet beautiful way to understand what I mean. God bless you in Jesus' name. My child, you may not know me, but I know everything about you. I know when you sit down and when you rise up. I'm familiar with all your ways. Even the very hairs on your head are numbered. For you were made in my image. In me you live and move and have your being. For you are my offspring. I knew you even before you were conceived. I chose you when I planned creation. You are not a mistake, for all your days are written in my book. I determined the exact time of your birth and where you would live. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. I knit you together in your mother's womb and brought you forth on the day you were born. I have been misrepresented by those who don't know me. I am not distant and angry, but I am the complete expression of love. And it is my desire to lavish my love on you, simply because you are my child and I am your father. I offer you more than your earthly father ever could, for I am the perfect father. Every good gift that you receive comes from my hand, for I am your provider and I meet all of your needs. My plan for your future has always been filled with hope, because I love you with an everlasting love. My thoughts toward you are as countless as the sand on the seashore, and I rejoice over you with singing, and I will never stop doing good to you for you are my treasured possession. I desire to establish you with all my heart and all my soul, and I want to show you great and marvelous things. If you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. Delight in me, and I will give you the desires of your heart, for it is I who gave you those desires. I am able to do more for you than you could possibly imagine, for I am your greatest encourager. I am also the Father that comforts you in all your troubles. When you are brokenhearted, I am close to you. As a shepherd carries a lamb, I have carried you close to my heart. One day I'll wipe away every tear from your eyes, and I'll take away all the pain you have suffered on this earth. For I am your Father, and I love you even as I love my Son, Jesus. For in Jesus, my love for you is revealed. He is the exact representation of my being. He came to demonstrate that for you, not against you and to tell you that I am not counting your sins. Jesus died 
so that you and I could be reconciled. His death was the ultimate expression of my love for you. I gave up everything I loved that I might gain your love. If you receive the gift of my son, Jesus, you receive me, and nothing will ever separate you from my love again. Come home, and I'll throw the biggest party heaven has ever seen. I've always been father, and will always be father. My question is, will you be my child? I'm waiting for you. Love your dad, almighty God. I was born and raised and educated in Canada. And uh, I did not meet Christians till I was 27 years of age. Uh, but I was very, in fact, my parents make the point that as soon as I could talk, and I wasn't really talking until I was five years of age, but as soon as I could talk, I was asking questions, and in particular, questions about the universe. They claim I was kind of a born scientist. And I remember when I was seven years of age, uh, asking my parents the question, are the stars hot? And they assured me that the stars were very hot. Uh, but of course, I wanted to know why they were so hot. And so they told me to go to the library. And that's what I did. And I read every book I could find on astronomy and physics in the children's section of the Vancouver Public Library. And when I had done that and read all the books that were there, they gave me a pass to the adult section. Eventually, I wound up getting a pass to the university library. And it was at the age of eight that I knew that my future career would lie in astrophysics. And from the age of eight onwards, that was kind of the passion of my life, was pursuing uh, astrophysics. Um, by the time I was in my teenage years, I was beginning a study on what's called cosmology, the origin and structure of the universe. And at that time in the 1960s, there was all these debates about uh, is the universe steady state? Um, is it uh, oscillating or reincarnating like the Hindus and Buddhists uh, would claim that it is? Uh, or is it a Big Bang? And there are other descriptions too. But as I went into that study, it became clear to me that the astronomical observations were heavily favoring the Big Bang explanation and disproving the other explanations. And Big Bang cosmology really arose out of Einstein's theory of general relativity which tells us that the universe is continuously expanding and traceable back to a beginning. And reasoning along the same lines as Albert Einstein, I figured if the universe indeed has a beginning, there must be a beginner. And I came to that conclusion at age 16, and from this 16 onwards, I never doubted the existence of God. Uh, so that, that part was taken care of. Uh, and I had the good fortune of going to a high school uh, where we had people from all different cultures and religions. Uh, and therefore, uh, when I began to talk to people about how I discovered that this beginner or God exists, uh, I got exposed to a lot of different uh, people from different religious perspectives. And starting at age 17, I decided to do a study of the different religions of the world to see if any of them could possibly be a communication uh, from this cosmic beginner. And what they tell you in science is you should always begin with the easy problems first and leave the most difficult to the end. So on purpose, uh, well actually I began with the philosophers. Uh, I knew that Immanuel Kant, that the great uh, German philosopher, was also the father of modern cosmology. So I looked at what he had to write, looked at Descartes and a number of other philosophers, and what I recognized is they thought of space and time as being absolutes that eternally existed. And I knew that Big Bang cosmology disproved that. So I said, you know, these guys really aren't the right way. Uh, then I began to look at what the Hindus had to say. And uh, the Hindus speak about the reincarnating universe, which was a popular idea in the 1960s amongst astronomers, that the universe has multiple beginnings rather than just one beginning. Uh, where we grow from this beginning and then shrink and then there would be this rebirth. Uh, but the Hindus and their Vedas claim that the period of time between the two beginnings would be exactly 4.32 billion years. And uh, even back in the 1960s, we knew that number was definitely wrong. The universe was older than 4.32 billion years. And we also were able to demonstrate that the universe was so entropic, in other words, so efficient in radiating heat from hot bodies to cold bodies, 
it would allow no possibility for any kind of rebound or bounce mechanism. So at age 17, I recognized that the truth of the universe did not come through uh, Hinduism. And uh, therefore, Hinduism's message could not be compatible with the one that began the universe or created the universe. Now, in the public high school I attended, the dominant religion outside of atheism and agnosticism was Buddhism. Our high school was 80% Asians. And they told me I needed to look at what the Buddhists had to say, so I did that. But I discovered that the Buddhists borrow everything that they teach about cosmology, the origin and structure of the universe, directly from the Hindus. And I said, therefore, the truth is not in Buddhism either. Uh, then I picked up the Quran, and when I began to go through the Quran, I noticed kind of a common denominator here, uh, that the Quran, like the Buddhist writings and the Hindu writings I was being exposed to, were highly repetitious. They kept repeating themselves, and the language was vague. And I guess what concerned me most of all, there was this appeal to intellectual snobbery. If you're one of the great enlightened ones, you'll be able to understand the meaning of this text. Otherwise, you're out of luck. And I said, that's not what I see in the record of nature. When I look out at the universe, I see a revelation there that is clear and direct and ready and open for investigation and testing. And uh, that bothered me that when I went into these other holy books, I didn't see that direct communication or that invitation to put things to the test. Now, there was one fellow in our high school classroom who was of the Baha'i faith. And what he told me is that in Baha'i, what they do is that they take the kernels of truth from the world's great religions and put them together into a consistent package. So it says, great, show me what you got. And as I spent a few days looking at the Baha'i teachings, I went back to my friend and said, well, from what I can tell, what the Baha'i have done is to borrow the great mistakes in the world's religions and to put them together into an inconsistent package. And he wound up leaving the Baha'i faith. Now, and I told you earlier uh, that I didn't meet Christians until I was 27 years of age. What I meant by that was to get close enough to a Christian where I could have a conversation on some spiritual matter. That did not happen until I was 27. And that's because in Canada, there just aren't as many Christians as there are here in the United States. Uh, they're harder to meet. Um, However, I did get to see two Christians from 30 feet away when I was 11 years old. And these were two businessmen that came into our public school classroom and put a box on our teacher's desk. And in that box were Gideon Bibles. And we're all invited to come forward and take one if we wanted one. And I still carry around with me that Gideon Bible I picked up when I was 11 years of age. Now, I didn't read it until I was 17. It stayed untouched on my bookshelf for six years. And in hindsight, I'm rather glad that I did not pick it up until I was 17, because uh, those Gideons gave me what we would uh, call a foreign language edition of the Bible. It's King James English. Mm -hmm. And at age 11, I think I would have been quite intimidated. But one of the benefits of a Canadian public education is starting in grade seven, they saturate you with the plays of William Shakespeare. And I had to memorize literally over a thousand lines from the different plays of William Shakespeare. So by the time I was 17, I was fluent in King James English. And as they began to go through this book, I noticed immediately how different it was from all the other holy books that undergird the religions of the world. Uh, namely, that it was clear, it was direct, and it was specific. Unlike these other holy books, I didn't see a lot of repetition or vagueness. It mentions places, uh, points of history and science and geography, things that could easily be put to the test. And I think what encouraged me as a young scientist is as I began to go through this book, I found repeated invitations to put this to the test. Uh, for example, we have in the writings of the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5.21, Everything must be tested. Hold fast to that which is good. And uh, again, this is repeated throughout the Bible. And the Bible is the only holy book I picked up that ever had this invitation to objectively put what you're reading uh, to the test. 
And, you know, I began on page one. Uh, I thought, you know, I, I want to get the Genesis one. By the way, the Gideons did not give me uh, anything except the Psalms, Proverbs, and uh, the New Testament. So I wound up getting a complete Bible, started in page one. And I went through Genesis chapter one. I found the scientific method. Now, I'd been trained in Canada from grade one forward. Every year of school, we were taught the scientific method, but they never told us where the scientific method came from. Uh, and when I opened up Genesis 1, I found the elements of the scientific method built right into the text. And this had a huge impression upon me as a 17-year-old uh, studying science. And let me just review for you what I found in Genesis chapter 1. First of all, uh, the step one of the scientific method is do make no attempt to interpret until you first establish the frame of reference. And so uh, we need to identify the frame of reference. In fact, Galileo said at his trial that the big, biggest mistake you can make in Bible interpretation is to fail to identify the frame of reference. And you say, where do you see that? Well, notice Genesis 1-2 before you get into the six creation days. It tells us that the Spirit of God is hovering over the surface of planet Earth. So it tells us that we are to interpret the sequence of the events in the six creation days from the perspective of an observer on the surface of planet Earth. So it's not looking down on the planet, it's being on the planet, looking up at the clouds and looking across the surface. And that makes a huge difference in how you interpret the events of the six creation days. Now, step two of the uh, scientific method is to determine the initial conditions. Make no attempt to interpret until you establish those initial conditions. What else do you see in Genesis 1-2? The Spirit of God is hovering over the surface of the waters, and it's empty of life, unfit for life. The water covers the whole surface of the planet, and it's dark upon the surface of the waters. So those are the four initial conditions. And then you go through uh, the six creation days. Now, as you go through those six creation days, the third step of the scientific method that we teach our students, do not try to interpret when you do your experiment or make your observations, or in this case, read the biblical text. Simply note what happens, where it happens, when, the order, and then you write that down in a notebook, and when you're all done, well, you want to note the final conditions, and having noted those final conditions, now and only now are you free to make an interpretation. But it's an interpretation you make lightly, and then you want to test that interpretation with other observations and experiments. And this is one of the beautiful things I found about the Bible, is that it's loaded with many creation accounts. You know, what you find in the other holy books might be one creation account uh, or two, uh, but in the Bible we have 25 uh, different accounts of uh, creation. Um, now, having done that, kind of looked at that scientific method outline, by the way, the Bible follows that pattern every time it describes a sequence of physical events. And it wasn't until I was 27 years of age and began to read the writings of the Scottish theologian Thomas Torrance and the 28-volume set his Scottish academic press put out on the science and the Christian faith that had discovered that the scientific method really came directly from the Bible. That was the birth of the scientific revolution. It's no accident that the scientific revolution came out of the Reformation and Western Europe. It was uh, Bible scholars reading the Bible, discovering this method, and applying it to their scientific research and that was the birth of the scientific revolution. So it does come uh, straight from uh, the pages of the Bible. Now, following this biblical method, so the Bible tells us everything must be put to the test, but it also tells you how to put it to the test. And when you do that, this is the order of events you get for Genesis chapter 1. Uh, Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, uh, the word in the Hebrew for heavens and earth is shamayen ares, which means the entire physical universe. The Hebrew word for earth has five different literal definitions. The Hebrew word for heaven has three different literal definitions. But the word shamayen ares is kind of like our English word butterfly. 
butterfly's got nothing to do with butter or fly, it means something very different. Likewise, heaven's plural, attached to earth's singular, means something different. It means the entire physical universe encompassing all matter, energy, space, and time. In the beginning, God created. The verb there, bara, means to create something brand new that never existed before. Entirely compatible with the Big Bang singularity, which tells us that there's an actual beginning of matter, energy, space, and time. Genesis 1 starts off with that claim. Now this is important because when you look at the other holy books of the religions of the world, they speak about God or God's creating within space and time that always exists. The Bible gives a radically different message, that God creates independent of space and time. And so space and time are created when God creates the universe. Then we notice that the frame of reference shifts from the universe as a whole to the surface of planet Earth. So we go from Genesis 1-1 to 1-2, it shifts our point of view from the universe down to the surface of planet Earth with those four initial conditions. And then we begin with the first creation day, let there be light. Notice the text does not say that God created the light. He says, let the light be. It's dark on the surface of the waters because the light of the universe is not able to come through the atmosphere of planet Earth to penetrate to the waters. So it's dark because of the fact that the clouds prevent the light of the sun, for example, from penetrating through the clouds. But let there be light is a statement of how God transforms the earthy atmosphere of planet Earth so that that atmosphere is no longer opaque to light but is transparent or translucent for light. Now I grew up in coastal British Columbia translucent skies is kind of what we had all the time. Hardly ever saw the sun, but we could see the light from the sun as it would diffuse through uh, those uh, clouds. So that's what happened on creation day one. Let there be light. God transformed the atmosphere, and now photosynthesis could begin on the surface of the earth in the waters. Keep in mind, there's water over the whole surface of the earth, no continents at this point. Creation day two, again does not use the word create, it says, let there be waters above and waters below. The waters below referring to the liquid water that was all over the surface of the earth. The water above referring to the water vapor atmosphere. And this is a statement of God setting up a stable water cycle where you got water in the atmosphere above, liquid water below, and they circulate one from the other. And this is something that was critical that God performed a miracle in order to prepare for the watering of the future continental land masses. Then you move into creation day three, and it begins by talking about how God gathers the water. And now instead of having an ocean that covers the whole surface of the earth, we have oceans and continents. Land masses begin to appear. And then dasha, let the land masses produce plants. Now the verb dasha there could be interpreted that God supernaturally created the plants, or that he worked through the natural process to bring about the plants or a combination of the two. This is an example of where the scriptures do not give us a clear answer about how to resolve the creation evolution debate. However, you'll be hearing in further lectures that indeed it was supernatural intervention, uh, not simply God working through the natural process to bring about these plants upon the continental land masses. Then we move into creation day four. And it says, let there be the great lights. Notice the text does not say that God created the great lights. He says, let the great lights be. So we have the sun, moon, and stars for the first time becoming visible to the observer on the surface of the earth. In other words, this is when the atmosphere gets transformed from being permanently translucent to at least occasionally being transparent. Uh, where observers can now see the objects responsible for the light. And in verse 15, uh, which follows the 14th verse, where it says, let there be the great lights, verse 15 says, so that they may serve uh, to mark seasons and years. And for whom? Well, for all the creatures that are going to show up on creation days 5 and 6. And on creation days 5 and 6, the, talk, the text talks about God creating life forms, that need the visibility, at least on occasion, of the sun, moon, and stars to regulate their complex biological clocks. And that would apply to anything more advanced than a clam. 
clams need the occasional visibility of the sun, moon, and stars. And so before the fifth creation day, we have these more primitive creatures. After uh, creation day four, we have these advanced creatures that need that visibility. Then we have the 16th verse, which says, uh, so God made the sun, moon, and stars, but the verb asah is in the completed form, letting us know that the sun, moon, and stars were completed before the fourth day. It doesn't tell us exactly when, when but that God had created them uh, previously to that fourth creation day. Uh, Genesis 1, 1 would tell us in the beginning, before the six creation days. And then we move into creation day five, where Toxie swarms of small sea creatures. And I believe this is a reference to the Cambrian explosion of life, where you have the sudden burst of complex life in many different forms. It shows up all at once. And then it talks about God creating birds and sea mammals towards the end of creation day five. Soulish creatures. In other words, what we have is simply physical life for the first four creation days. Creation day five is the first time that we see soulish life. A life that's not purely physical, but soulish. Soulish in the sense that God imbues these creatures with mind, will, and emotions so they can relate to one another, but also relate to the future human beings. And uh, then in uh, creation day six, it talks about a God creates three specialized kinds of land mammals. Creation day five talks about birds and sea mammals generically. Creation day six does not talk about land mammals generically, but rather focuses on three specialized kinds of land mammals, those that God specifically created to cohabit the planet uh, with humanity. Then last of all, it talks about God creating the human species, male and female. And it uses a saw barad, just like with the soulish or the soulish creatures. When God created the soulish creatures, there's something about them that he manufactured supernaturally, but there's something in them that's totally brand new. Uh, what was manufactured uh, would have been the, uh, the physical component. What's brand new would be the spirit. Well, with, likewise with humanity. We are supernaturally manufactured by God from the dust of the earth, from what previously existed, but there's something in this that's brand new. Uh, we're the only species that God created, according to Genesis 1, that's body, soul, and spirit. And, uh, so, uh, and that gives us the capacity to communicate with God himself. We're the only species uh, that's given that capacity to ask questions like, who am I? Uh, who created me? Why am I here? How can I have a relationship with my creator? Uh, that's the spirit component uh, within us. Now, as a young man of 17, it kind of took me about four hours to figure all that out. Uh, I was kind of going through all my textbooks and checking it out. But what I discovered was this, that here was a, an account of creation. The first account of creation I'd read in any of the holy books that actually fit what the record of nature revealed. Uh, when I was nine years old, uh, I read a book on creation myths. And it talked about uh, over a hundred different uh, creation stories in different cultures of the world. Well, they were good for a laugh, and what they were talking about was just absurd in terms of what the record of nature revealed to us. But the one that came the closest uh, to what the actual record of nature was revealing was the Enuma Elisha of the Babylonians. And uh, that's an account of creation that mentions 14 creation events, and it gets two out of 14 right. Twelve wrong, two right. But when I picked up this Bible, what I found was an account of 13 creation events. All 13 were correctly described, and all 13 were in the correct chronological sequence. Now, the probability of Moses getting it in the correct order, uh, even if he was given the correct information, that probability would be one chance in 13 factorial. That's one chance in 13 times 12 times 11 times 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. You can figure that out while you're listening to me. It's a very small probability. But an even tinier probability is that Moses actually got all 13 events correctly described, correctly described in the correct chronological sequence. So at age 17, that was my first clue that this book may be different from the other holy books in that it could actually be a communication from the being that created the universe. How else could Moses have possibly gotten it that accurate if he didn't have 
some inspired uh, information from the creator of the universe himself. Uh, but I kept on going. And uh, what I discovered uh, as I uh, kept moving is that there are many creation accounts in the Bible. In fact, there are 25 chapter length or longer creation accounts in the Bible. Now, what I found in the other holy books at best was just one or two creation accounts. Here I found 25. So here is an opportunity for me to put to the test uh, my uh, interpretation of Genesis 1. And I was very curious, does the rest of the Bible support this? And so I began to go through uh, these texts and actually try to put my interpretation to the test. Let me just give you a couple of examples of how that worked out for me as a young man. Uh, Job 38 and 39, for example, take you through all six, of, all, all the events of the six creation days. They're not numbered like they are in Genesis chapter 1, uh, but it literally describes all the events and actually gives us more scientific detail about the events of the six creation days than you find in Genesis chapter 1. But for example, in uh, Job uh, 38, uh, verses 8 and 9, uh, we have God saying to Job, I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness, it referring to the oceans that encompass the earth. So what it's telling us here in Job 38, that the reason why it was dark on the surface of the waters of the early planet Earth is because God had wrapped the planet in this blanket that kept it dark. So that supports the interpretation that indeed God had created these sun, moon, and stars at the beginning, but their light was not getting through to the surface of the waters because of this dark cloud layer. So whereas Genesis 1 implies it, what we see in Job 38 is an explicit statement supporting that interpretation. Now, one other thing I noticed in uh, my first reading of Genesis 1 is that when you go through these creation days, uh, it brackets each day by an evening and a morning. And I expected to see that follow through the entire text, but that did not happen. The first six days are bracketed by an evening and a morning, but not the seventh day. When you get to the seventh day in Genesis 1, there's no evening and morning. And so, reading that for the first time, I said, then we must be in the seventh day if indeed there is no start point and uh, end point described in the text for the seventh day. We must still be in the seventh day. That's why there's no evening and morning for the seventh day. Well, when you read one of the New Testament creation accounts in Hebrews 4, for example, we have this statement. He has spoken about the seventh day, referring to God. They shall never enter my rest. It still remains that some will enter that rest. So what we notice here in Hebrews it's referring to the seventh day of creation in the present tense and in the future tense. So we're still in that seventh day. Now one of the things that have bothered me ever since I was 10 years old is what I refer to as a fossil record enigma. Now the fossil record enigma is that before humans come upon the scene, we see in the fossil record extensive evidence for both speciation events and extinction events new life forms coming into existence and old life forms disappearing from existence. But as soon as humans come upon the scene, all we see are the extinctions, not the speciation events, only extinctions. And that had bothered me ever since I was 10. How come there's this difference between what happens before human beings and what happens after human beings? Well, I got a very satisfying answer to that out of Genesis chapter 1. Namely, what we see in Genesis chapter 1 is that for six days, God creates. On the seventh day, he stops creating. He rests. So for six creation periods, we have God creating these new species of life. But on the seventh day, he stops creating new species of life. When he created Adam and Eve, this is when he rested from his work of creation. So according to Genesis 1, we don't see speciation events today because God is at rest. He's not creating new species. Whereas we see it in the past because that's when God was actively creating. Now, another creation account that actually takes you through all the events of the six creation days is Psalm 104. Again, it doesn't number the days, 
uh, but like Job 38 and 39, actually gives you much more scientific content about what's happening in those six creation days than what you would get in Genesis chapter 1. So it's another opportunity to test uh, one's interpretation of Genesis chapter 1. And when you see towards the end of Psalm 104, is that life dies off, but that God uh, recreates. God replaces the life forms that go extinct with new life forms that are better adapted to the changing earth and the changing sun. So here's an explicit statement backing up this fossil record enigma that it's a property of all life to die off or go extinct. That happens just through thermodynamics and gravity and electromagnetism. Laws of physics will guarantee that over time. But that God replaces the life forms that go extinct with new life forms by supernatural intervention. Now, I'll give you a little insight on that. This is not something I was aware of at age 17, but it's something we've become aware of since. There's a good reason for why we see this in Scripture, because of what's called the faint sun paradox. That if we look at the sun over the course of its history, when it's very young, it loses mass, loses mass at a fairly good clip. It was about 7% more massive than it is today. And the luminosity of a star goes up with the fourth power of its mass. So during the early part of the sun's history, it would dim considerably. It would actually dim by 15%. So it was about as bright as it is today when it started off and then became 85% as bright. But what happened in the core of the sun is that we had temperature conditions there which would fuse hydrogen into helium. And this is really where the sun gets its energy today is from hydrogen fusion. But the more hydrogen that gets fused into helium, then the uh, more uh, powerfully that furnace will burn. And so what happens is over the course of the hydrogen burning in the sun, it gets hotter and hotter and hotter as more and more hydrogen gets converted into helium. Helium is a catalyst uh, for the furnace. And so we understand today that the sun went from 100% of its brightness down to 85%, then from 85% back up to 100%. Now, life can only tolerate a 1% change in the sun's luminosity. So, well, how did God deal with this? The way God dealt with it is he created just the right life forms at just the right time. So those life forms would pull greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere, or add greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, and by controlling the atmosphere by the different life forms that God creates, he is able to keep the surface of planet Earth at the ideal temperature for life throughout the entire uh, history of life here on planet Earth. Now, the planet today is spinning five times more slowly than it did when God first created life. And so that kind of explains why we only see bacteria first. Bacteria can handle a four or five hour rotation rate. We can't. Uh, our bodies would be just sheared to bits by wind forces uh, that would be engendered by that rapid rotation. And so we see here in Psalm 104 is a God understanding exactly how the physics of the earth and the sun will change over time, creates exactly the right life forms at just the right time and just the right diversity and abundance in order to keep everything perfectly balanced for life here on planet earth. And this also requires that he remove occasionally those life forms uh, that would no longer be appropriate to keeping things in the best fit situation. Well, we have these 25 creation accounts in the Bible. And I went through those 25 creation accounts over the course of about 18 months, from the time I was 17 to the time I was 19. I determined that the Bible had made over 200 accurate predictions of future scientific discoveries. Keep in mind, for example, that the Bible speaks in 11 different places of a continuously expanding universe from the creation event where you've got this beginning of space and time. No astronomer, no philosopher had any clue about the beginning of space and time at the beginning of the universe. Neither did they have any clue that the universe was continuously expanding. None of that became public knowledge until 1917, when Albert Einstein developed this uh, theory of general relativity. And what we see here is the Bible authors going all the way back to Job and were already communicating to us about these detailed cosmic characteristics. So this is an example where the Bible was thousands of years ahead of its time, 
accurately predicting future scientific discoveries. And so I kind of did a back of an envelope calculation when I turned 19 about what would be the probability that these Bible authors could predict these future scientific discoveries without any inspiration or knowledge or communication from the God that created the universe. And I determined that that probability had to be less, much less than one chance in 10 to the 300. Now that's 300 zeros after the one. And uh, that same week uh, at the University of British Columbia, our physics professor had given us the assignment to calculate the probability that one of the students in the class would be killed by a sudden reversal of the second law of thermodynamics. It was a class in statistical mechanics. And I can tell you the probability is very tiny, but he wanted us to calculate what that probability was. And I'm going to try to help you get through that. In this auditorium here, we have quadrillions of air molecules. And the physicists here in the audience will tell you that those air molecules are all at different temperatures. For example, within this room, there are trillions of air molecules that are below the freezing point of water. And so there's a tiny statistical probability that those trillions of air molecules below the freezing point of water will, within the next five seconds, wander in the vicinity of where this young lady is sitting and freeze her to death. And we had to calculate what that probability was. Well, it turns out that that probability is only one chance in 10 to the 80th. Such an extremely tiny probability that this young lady would be fully justified in concluding it's never going to happen. In fact, the point of our professor was to tell us or communicate to us there's no way, given how tiny that probability is, that there ever could be such a reversal of the second law of thermodynamics anytime, anywhere in the entire universe uh, as geography and history. It just won't happen. That probability is so tiny. Well, what I realized is that I had just demonstrated to myself that this book we call the Bible is at least 10 to the 200 times more reliable than the second law of thermodynamics. And this is what brought me to a point of decision. I realized that it was not rational for me to trust my life moment by moment in the reliability of the second law of thermodynamics and not put even greater trust and confidence in the reliability of what's written here in this book. And uh, thank God for the Gideons. In every one of the Bibles they give away, they have two pages at the end that tell you what you need to do once you become persuaded that this book here indeed is the error-free Word of God. And the first thing I read in those two pages is that they tell me that uh, you know, God demands a standard of moral perfection. And that's one of the reasons why I was attracted to this book. Of all the holy books I read, this had the most beautiful and elegant description of how God wanted us to behave. And I made a commitment at age 17, maybe a foolish one, where I said, I'm going to do everything I can to live up to the moral standard of this book. But the harder I tried, the more miserable I felt. The more I became aware I was falling short of God's standard of moral perfection. And the Gideons pointed out to me, that's the conscience that God gives us. God writes his law on the heart of every human being. And that law tells us that God's standard is one of perfection, and we can't make it. But that God is a God of love. And how he sent his son, the creator of the universe himself, to live here on planet Earth as a human being. And in that humanity, he lived a life of moral perfection. And I said, yeah, the Gideons are right. Because I remember reading the gospel accounts where Jesus of Nazareth would give a sermon in front of a large audience. And he would tell people in those sermons that he was morally perfect. And his mother was in the audience agreeing with him. I said, you're not going to fool your mom. And his brothers and sisters were there too. So I said, this guy had to be morally perfect. Yet in that moral perfection, he took upon himself the penalty for our moral imperfections by dying a death on the cross. And as the Gideons point out, what Jesus, the creator of the universe, has done is to make an offer to every human being to trade his moral perfection for our moral imperfection. And I said, that's a great deal. And the Gideons don't let you off the hook. In the back of every one of their Bibles, they've got a place for you to sign your name and date it, making your commitment 
to have Jesus Christ be the boss of your life, the Lord of your life, and uh, your Savior. And so I signed my name to that. And the last thing that Gideon's communicated there is to say, when you make that commitment to make the creator of the universe uh, your Lord and your personal Savior, then God will send you the Holy Spirit to help you do the things that you can't do on your own. He'll give you the desire to live the Christian life and the power to live the Christian life, not all at once, it's step by step. Well, the very next day I saw that laid out because I had been studying the Christian faith in total secrecy because I was surrounded by unbelievers, including my own family. So I kept it all secret. But when I read through this book, I realized anyone that makes a commitment to Jesus Christ is committing himself as well to share what they've discovered with others. And so I picked on my lab partner as my first victim. And uh, he could tell I wanted to talk. And he says, Hugh, please, I need to talk today. And he says, I've been, I've been going through personal struggles in my life that I've not talked to anyone about. I really need to talk to somebody who knows something about God. Do you know anybody in this campus that knows anything about God? And so I got to share with them my own study. And we talked for four hours that day, had many conversations. And I got to see several of my fellow students and uh, professors uh, come to faith in Christ. But it was really at Caltech, uh, after I got my PhD, where I met Christians. You know, in Canada, they're hard to find. In the United States, they're everywhere. And uh, it was at Caltech that I ran into astronomers who were Christians. Uh, they told me how to find a church that wasn't a cult, uh, that took the Bible seriously. And I found one of those churches. And uh, they had me begin teaching classes on uh, how to use science as a tool uh, to bring people who've never had contact with a Christian faith uh, to Christ. And it was that church that actually helped me launch uh, new uh, reasons to believe, an organization founded to develop new reasons to believe.